and they were 19s. And there's so many different formats in American football that I've been involved with over the years. I've done 11 man, obviously, in the US. I've done 12 man with um, some coaches from Canada that I've worked with. Um, and then right on down from there, nine man, eight man, seven man, six man, five man. I mean, literally everything that you can think of, someone is playing somewhere, whether it's full contact or flag football. Um, someone has adapted the game that started back in the 1860s into you know X number of people versus X number of people. Sometimes on a full top size pitch, sometimes on a very small or narrow pitch, sometimes indoors, which causes all sorts of confusion and rebounds off the walls and stuff. But essentially, the game remains the same. You've got, you've got a ball, you try and advance it, you try and stop the other people from advancing it, you tackle each other, um, and you try and score points. And my emphasis in everything that I've done over the years, and I started coaching in 1974, just to give you an idea of how ancient I am, um, the emphasis has always been on trying to figure out the best way to make use of available talent and to give the players that I've been involved with coaching the greatest advantage within the rules possible. So that it's not just two groups of guys or girls out there butting heads, but that we put as much thought as possible into preparing our team so that they don't just go out there and butt heads. Because when you play football that way, if you're not the best head butters, you're in trouble. If you don't have the most raw talent, you have to be able to do more than just get out there and, and hit somebody, as the classic saying goes. We have a, 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 a name for coaches like that. We call them hit somebody coaches, because that's all they know how to tell their players to do. And it's not particularly useful after the first training session or so. So we want to be able to tell you more about how to gain an advantage for yourself, how to present yourself to maximum advantage on the football field, how to get the most out of your natural ability. We, you know, we as coaches have to be able to tell you something other than, you know, go find someone to hit. That's not coaching. That's like underemployed dad on a weekend, okay? And hopefully, as a coach, you've invested more than that in learning about the game yourself so that when the time comes to coach someone, to teach them how to get their best advantage possible on the field, you've got useful information to impart to them. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about an 11-man system that I've been involved with for a number of years because it exemplifies the three things that I think are involved in all phases of football. And I've actually done a video at last year's BAFCA convention about these three topics, and some of you may have seen it. And it's how to use these three different factors in all phases of the game, in offense, defense, and special teams. And that's speed, how to maximize the available speed that you have on your team. Power, how to do the same thing with the strength of your players and their ability to deliver that at the point of impact. And deception, which is how to do something other than what the other team is expecting. Because if you do what's expected all the time, there's going to be people there waiting for you. If you don't do what's expected all the time, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to run headlong into five tacklers. And that's a good thing when you're on offense. Now, speed is to a certain extent coachable. You can't teach it per se, but you can train it. You can get people as fit as they can be. You can make them work hard at gaining muscular core strength and being able to run as fast as they can, especially in explosive football style situations. We're not talking about running a 100 yard dash. We're not talking about a bloody marathon. We mean explosions over five yards at a time. Boom, boom, boom. That's football speed. Now when you can run 20 yards downfield and have no one near you as you catch the winning touchdown, that's also football speed. But the kind we're more concerned about is the five yard sprint. Being the first person to win the five yard sprint, that's football speed and to be able to do that 40 or 50 times in a game. That's the important part of training for football, is to be able to repeat that kind of explosive speed again and again and again. That is your level of advantage in football with speed. If you're an Olympic sprinter, that's fantastic. We'll stick you out wide and they have to defend you with at least two guys, that's brilliant. That means we get to play 10 on nine. That's our advantage right there. When you put someone out who is so freaking scary, 
in terms of foot speed, that they have to put two people on him, we win. Whether he can catch a football or not. As long as they keep two defenders on him, we win. We're playing 10 on 9. Advantage us. But that's not the kind of football speed that you can teach. What you can teach is core fitness and explosion and repetition. And keep people going down the field like that and keep training players so that they can reproduce that kind of explosion when they need to in the fourth quarter of a close game. When everyone's tired. The greatest football coach in my mind that ever lived, a guy named Lombardi, once said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And that's why, as coaches, our job is to make sure that you're not fatigued when it matters. And that's basically achieved by fatiguing the hell out of you in training, again and again and again and again. We want to be able to make you wish that you had never got out of bed that morning in training, when, you know, when you're at training, because when the game is on the line, you're going to have the fitness and explosion that you need to dominate. And you're not going to be the guy that gives up in the fourth quarter. That's what coaches are supposed to do with players, is get them ready for that moment. So you can affect speed on the margins. You can make people a little bit faster. If they're not fit, you can make them a lot faster. If they've got most of their fitness you know, already taken care of through repetitive training using intelligent means, then you're not going to be able to get them much faster by more training. You can only affect speed on the margins after you get someone in good football shape. You can make them a little bit quicker by doing certain exercises, but it's not something that you can say, all right, we're going to train twice as hard and you're going to get twice as fast. That's not how speed works. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. It's a factor, <coughs> but it's not the one that coaching is going to dominate the most. A lot of speed is innate for people who are fit, there's going to be, you know, when everyone is trained to like 90% of their peak fitness, there's going to be some guys that are a lot faster than others. That's just how the human physiology works. So as a coach, you acknowledge that and put the faster guys in positions where they can use that speed to dominate. And you find something else for the slower guys to do. Hopefully they're larger and stronger, you know, and, and it'll all work out in the end. If they're small and slow, well, you know, there's always bad men. Um, Power. We have more control over power as coaches because you can keep increasing strength up to a very high level if you're willing to put in the time and effort. Much more so than you can speed. You know, if someone runs, you know, 100 meters in 11.2 seconds, you're not going to take three seconds off that time. I, I don't care how good a coach you are. I don't care how hard you work that particular run. You just cannot go past certain limits for speed. With power, with strength, on the other hand, with explosive strength in particular, of the kind, again, that we need for football skills, you can double, triple the ability of someone to move weight. I mean, there are upper limits, obviously, to strength as well. But from a coaching perspective, they matter a lot less. You can get people very, very strong if you work them hard enough. And the beautiful thing thing is, is when you're starting with young players, you don't even have to get in the weight room. Body weight exercises are the best way to get young players to start to be fit, to have strong cores, unlike mine, I mean strong cores, and to build strength from the core out, so that you've got powerful legs that can handle the explosions that football requires, so that you've got an upper body that can allow you to shed people, to block people, to do whatever you have to do. So power is something that coaches have a lot more say over because they can tell you, look, you're a good player. You understand the game. You've got the basics down. You need to get stronger. And here's what you're going to do. Here's a training program. If you follow it, you will get stronger. I can't be in the weight room with you. I can't be out back of your place helping you do the sit-ups and push-ups and, you know, body weight squats and whatever else we've decided that you, in your particular age group, need to do to start your journey towards real strength. You know, when you're 19, I can't be there in the weight room with you. Not all the time. I can come supervise workouts sometimes, but I can't be there when you need to be doing the hard graft. But I can tell you how to do it safely, how not to overtrain, how not to hurt yourself in the process, to do it intelligently, carefully, safely. And so, as a coach, I've got a little bit of ability to make you faster, 
I can make you fitter, and that's most of the game with speed. With power, getting fit is the start, and then you start to build real strength. Once you've got basic core fitness, that's when you can start to pack on the explosive strength. <coughs> but as a coach, where I have the input every single time, on every single phase of the game, every play that we're out there, is deception. Because it's designed into the way that we do things if we're intelligent coaches. If we're not, then we're hit somebody coaches. And we're going to go out there and we're going to say, okay, you know, block him, block him, block him, block him, head on, you know, just butt heads with those guys and we'll figure out how to score some points. That's not coaching. That's not coaching. There's a place for that in the game of football. When everyone at the game knows that you need half a yard and they know that you've got a strong running back and they know that you've got a decent offensive line it doesn't take you know a psychic to tell you what you're going to do with the football but even then as the Seahawks discovered a couple of Super Bowls ago when they had the best running back in the game and they were down on the what two three yard line and they ran a pass play and it got intercepted and they lost the Super Bowl when if they'd given that back the, fo the football, there's a good chance he would have scored. If they'd faked the ball to that running back and run a little play action pass, they could have walked into the end zone. But that would have involved deception. Instead, they got too damn cute, decided to do something. What particularly grieves me about that moment is that they decided to do something with, a, with this particular formation where two receivers lined up like this because he was going to come in here, take the quick pass from the quarterback. He was going to block here, and he was going to walk into the end zone. Problem, when you do something the same way every single time, and they'd run this like 30 times during the season, and every single time they lined up like this, they threw that pass, guess what the defense thought? We knew where the ball's going. Interception because they didn't ever do anything other than this from that formation. No matter how good they were, if they didn't do something other than that one little quick pass to the guy who stacked behind, if they didn't change what they were doing a little tiny bit, then the defense was going to know instantly what was coming. And they did, and they intercepted the football, and the Seahawks lost the Super Bowl for no good reason. Because of the stupidity of their coaching staff, and yes, I'll say that about Pete Carroll, I'm happy to say it. I've said it to his face. You know, you can't do this and win, even if you're the Seattle Seahawks. And that's why deception becomes so important. Lining up and running the ball straight ahead and butting heads one-on-one -on -one is great, as long as you're bigger, stronger, and faster than the other team. If you're not, you got to do some different stuff. you got to try and misdirect them a little bit so that you don't have 11 people waiting for your ball carrier at the line of scrimmage. Okay? Now, even if you're not small and weak and slow, you can benefit from deception. Even the better teams that bother to learn how to do different things in different ways to keep the defense guessing a little tiny bit, get better when they do that. And the thing is, it doesn't cost you any more to learn a deceptive system than it does a butting head system. And it's a lot more fun to play in quite frankly. Because instead of going out and just, you know, boom, 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 we're gonna we're gonna literally butt heads with everyone on the defense. We're gonna just stick our helmets in there, because of course we never stick our helmets in when we're blocking. Because we're smarter than that. We don't want to like get paralyzed and you know urinate through a tube for the rest of our life. But we're not gonna just one on one, no angle blocking, no basis for you know, a mechanical advantage for what we're doing. We're going to try something completely different. So, in this system, which dates back to 1937, with the New York Giants, the back here, the wing back, goes in motion, and when he's roughly between the guard and the tight end, and yes, that is a tight end. There's no tackle on this side of the formation. Both tackles are over here. That's the start of deception, by the way, because oftentimes you'll find that because this guy is, is here on the line of scrimmage, 
they're going to think that's the tight end and they're going to line up a pass defender on him. He's covered, and in real football rules, I know it doesn't apply here to a certain extent, because he's on the line of scrimmage and he's on the line of scrimmage, he's not an eligible pass receiver. So you take advantage by bringing him over to this side of the formation to give you more blocking power with two big fat asses on this side instead of just one. You know, guard, tackle, tackle. If they waste a pass defender on him, they're in trouble because he's not eligible. He's not going out for a pass. He's your best receiver, and they're going to need to at least double cover him. Okay? Here's a lot of power blocking over here, so you know where we're going to be running at least part of the time. But rather than just line up with the two big fat asses here and run behind them, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to make it harder for the defense to predict where the ball's going. Because if they don't know where it's going, they've got to defend more front. If you line up in a power eye formation and you run with like two fullbacks ahead of the running back and you've got you know, a large center and two large guards, the defense really only has to worry about that middle of the formation. They really only have to like defend from here to here. We want to spread them out so they have to defend all of this equally. Because you can't do that as well as you can from here to here. Anyone can crowd bodies in here and stop you from running an isolation blast play up the middle. If they clog the, you know, the middle with enough bodies, they're going to slow you down, if not stop you. If you make them spread out to cover the entire frontage, then they're going to have a harder job. That's much more real estate for a defender. All right? You ask a guy to cover a gap of like a foot, and he's right there, he's going to be in pretty good position to do that. You tell the same guy he has to cover from here to the other side of that desk, you've got a little bit of more of a problem. Maybe he's good enough to do that. Maybe he's not. And we're going to find out by spreading out what we're doing and not making it so easy for that defender. Okay, That's our job as coaches. And we need to be able to explain to you guys what we're doing. So if you have a coherent system of bits that fit together into a hole, so there's like a wheel here and a cog there, and you put them all together, and all of a sudden it makes sense, then your job is easier as a player. Oh, yeah, I've got to block the backside on that play. We're running the speed sweep. This is the A formation. The wing back goes in motion to about here. The ball is snapped to the quarterback who spins around like he's stepping towards the football as it's snapped. So he takes a step, and then he pivots. And when he does that, the ball is hidden from the defense. And that's the start of deception. You know, there's a lot of teams that take the ball in a, a pistol or even a shotgun formation, and the guy's right there with the football, and then someone comes in front of him. And the ball is never hidden from the defense at any point. And OK, I understand what they're doing. But if you just take that little half pivot and turn your back to the defense, the ball's gone. Now if someone comes by, maybe they've got the ball now and maybe they don't. Maybe the next guy to come by on the other side is going to get the ball, and maybe not. Maybe the quarterback's going to keep the ball. In this case, the snap comes here. The quarterback pivots, turns his back to the defense. Now this guy who's in motion is already moving a pretty good clip. He's going to come right by behind the quarterback. And if he gets the ball, he's going to be out here real quick. And that's called a speed sweep, a fly sweep, a jet sweep. There's various names for it. People that don't know what they're talking about call it a reverse. It's not a reverse. You're not reversing direction. You know, If you come out here and then he comes back this way, that's a reverse. But this isn't a reverse. This is a speed sweep, fly sweep, jet sweep, whatever you want to call it. So with the quarterback's back turned to the defense and a man coming right behind him at pretty much full speed by the time he gets here, you hand him the ball, and you've got a pretty good running play outside. There's people blocking, blocking. You know, we'll, we'll get the corner defenders pretty much accounted for with a head on every defensive hat. And we're going to let this guy, who's your fastest player, obviously. You don't do this. You, know, you don't hand the ball to a motion guy who runs like I do. You know, you want to you make use of the available speed that you have. You can't coach it, but when you have it, you make sure you use it intelligently as a coach. So this is your, your fastest player, and he's out here with the football. That's great. If that's all you do, pretty soon you're going to get 9, 10, 11 defenders out here waiting for the fast guy with football. And that's why we don't just run a speed sweep play. We make it part of a series where everything starts off looking like everything else. Because you want to slow down defensive recognition. What do defenses try to do? They try and recognize what's going on and attack. They don't want to think. They want to react. They want to gang tackle. They want five, six, seven hats on the football. 
They want to hurt ball carriers. They want to punish them. And when you're playing defense, that's what you're going to want to do, too. But as an offensive coach, it's incumbent on us to make sure that they can't do that. If you just line up and pound the ball, you're going to end up with gang tackling. This is not being kind to our running backs, nor is it being particularly intelligent about the way that we try and move the football. What we're going to do instead is offer various threats every single time that the defense has to account for. One of those threats is out here, out wide to the right. Another of the threats is right up the middle with his running back, who's going to be the next person to pass by this quarterback, whose back is still turned to the defense. So the speed sweeper comes by. Maybe he gets the football. Maybe he doesn't. Quarterback doesn't even have to fake. He just stands here. And if he's faking getting the speed sweep, he can give it the fake action and keep going. And the defense has to respect that. They have to send at least one or two defenders after him. Because if they don't, you're going to hand it to him, and he's going to make a lot of yardage on a regular basis. So the ball's hidden. Speed sweeper goes by. OK, maybe he has the ball. You'll find out soon enough. The power back, the guy inside, comes by on the other side of the quarterback. Maybe he gets the ball. Maybe he doesn't. And if he doesn't, the quarterback then drops until he's as deep as that guy was originally, and then he bootlegs away from the sweep. Maybe he's got the ball. Maybe he doesn't. You won't find out right away. If you're the defense, you have to respect this, you have to respect this, you have to respect this. Now, psychology tells us that a moving threat is one that people react to, especially if it accelerates. We're hardwired to respond to acceleration. It's, I guess, from our days up in the trees or in caves. Something starts moving real fast, you know, it may be a lion, we haul ass. You know, we, we respond to that acceleration. That's built into us. So when this guy doesn't have the football, when he's not running the speed sweep, goes into motion here, the ball snap, runs behind the quarterback, he's doing the faking. We don't ask the quarterback to be handing the football all around when he's planning on keeping it. The ball is too important to be, you know, shoved around like a loaf of bread. When the quarterback has his back to the defense during this series, the speed sweeper comes by, he fakes like he's getting the ball. The fullback comes by here, he fakes like he's getting the ball. The quarterback keeps the damn ball here in the bread basket, safe, where no one can take it from him. Then he drops back till he's as deep as that fullback was, and then he bootlegs away. Now, if he's got the ball, he's a threat to run or pass out here. And if we're going to pass the ball, we're going to have a couple of receivers just sort of neatly layered in front of him. So he's got a short option, and he's got a deep option, and he can run. So he looks, he sees. Is the short guy open? Yes, throw him the ball. Is he covered? Yes, OK. Is the deep guy open? Yes, throw him the ball. Are both of them covered? Yes, run. It's not too hard. It's a series of easy decisions. And if you, you, know, if you trigger things from, is this guy open? Yes, no. And you make it like a flow chart, you never have to make a three-way decision. You never have to do anything hard. You look at a guy. Is there a defender near him? No, throw him the football. Now, is it the case that you can throw for five yards when you might have been able to make 10 or 12? Happens sometimes. We don't sweat it. Because the guy who catches the ball five yards deep may run for another 10 yards. If they're both open, we're not going to fault the quarterback for throwing to the shorter guy. We're not going to complain. He's just completed a pass that's, that's a positive for us. If he sees that both of them are covered, or if there's any sort of indecision, he runs. We'll make yards. If we make it back to the line of scrimmage, we're not going to complain. We're not going to worry about that. But the point here, with this built-in deception for the defense, the speed sweep look starts, and the defense is going to respond to that. Because this guy goes in motion, because they know he's fast, because he's made yardage even once on a speed sweep play, they're going to think, as soon as he goes in motion, oh, hell, here it comes again. And they're going to concentrate on that. And you're going to end up, literally, with three, four, maybe five defenders out here looking for the speed sweep. And then we win. Because what have we got here? We've got the other 10 offensive players playing against you know, seven, six, or five defenders. Those are good odds. That's a lot better than meeting a, a gang tackle here at the line of scrimmage. That's a lot better than the running back have to shake off four or five tacklers. Okay? This is what coaching has done. We prevent the defense from being able to swarm. We prevent them from instantly recognizing what's going on and attacking. 
You don't have to run into something like that as a player on offense. You want to be playing in a system like this, where your coaches have done the work of making it hard for the defense to figure out where the ball is. Speed sweep fake comes out here. Quarterback is going to bootleg out here, even without the ball. Every time he does, he's going to look for this defender here, who's responsible, defensive end, outside linebacker, whatever you want to call him, the end man on the line of scrimmage, the dreaded M-loss defender, the guy that's responsible for things like bootlegs and reverses. He's going to come upfield, and he's going to check the quarterback for the bootleg. We call this literally in the, in the playbook for defense. This is check boot. Okay, This guy comes upfield when the ball is snapped, check boot. He makes very, very sure the quarterback doesn't have the ball if he's, if he's looking like he's bootlegging. Now what happens? This isn't particularly lucrative, check boot. There's no stars made by checking boot. It's drudgery, okay? It's boring work. It has to be done because it affects the, it affects the, the integrity of the entire defense if he doesn't check boot. Because if this guy gets outside of containment with the football, the defense is in a world of hurt. But this isn't where all-star YouTube videos are made. No one's ever going to get famous from checking boot. You know what I mean? So he's going to get bored. And he's going to start chasing players. And he's going to start looking inside for the big hit, the big tackle. And he's going to fail his teammates. He's going to let them all down by looking for individual glory on defense. Okay? Because if this guy does get outside of the football, they're hosed. He's got two or three receivers in front of him. He's got no one, by definition, cutting him off from running. So we've got all the options in the world just because this one guy decided it was time to make the highlight reel. Okay? Which means that when this quarterback bootlegs out here without the football, what's he doing? He's looking at the defender every time. He's looking at the M loss defender. He's looking at the guy who should be checking boot. And he's making damn sure that he's checking boot. Because if he isn't, if he sees the guy getting bored or lazy or, or looking for glory, what does he do? He says, coach, they're not checking boot. What do we do? We run boot. This isn't rocket surgery, as the saying goes. We wait and see till they get sloppy, and then we attack what they're not doing. This drives what we do on offense sometimes. We keep a close eye on what the defense is good at and what they're not good at. And guess what we attack? What they're not good at. If they're slow, if they're weak, if they're undisciplined, we attack their slow foot speed with a speed sweep, we attack their weakness with power inside, and we attack their indiscipline with things like the bootleg. We make sure that we know they're not doing their job, and that's where we zone in on. Okay? This is offensive coaching. This is finding a weakness and exploiting it. Okay? Ruthless, merciless. You know, and it makes your, your jobs a lot easier as offensive players. So, let's get to the third part of this. You know, we know there's a speed sweep threat out here. We know there's a bootleg threat out here. This guy may not be the fastest man in the world, but if he's your quarterback, he's pretty good with throwing the football. And so, we've got just raw speed running as the threat here. Although you can have him throw uh, a pass as well. There's nothing stopping him doing that. Because if he releases downfield, and pretends that he's stock blocking a defender and then just keeps going. And if he's got an arm on him at all, if he can even heave a ball up in the air for 20 or 30 yards, you've got a great play there. If they're not being smart and, def and defending the deep zone, if they're not covering that deep receiver, then you've got a great halfback option pass here. Okay, but the primary threat, obviously, is getting outside of the football right now with a very fast man. <coughs> the threat over here is more complex. It's running and passing. He's probably not the greatest runner you've got, but now he's outside of containment with the football. It doesn't matter. I can run for yardage under those circumstances, especially if there's two or three receivers downfield in front of me, because the defense has to respect that. So they're not going to come up and attack me, especially me, when I'm running. Well, they're going to let me get my two or three yards before I die of exhaustion. But they have to, they have to cover the pass receivers. You know, They have to get the people who are downfield He's up here, he's here, he's out here in the flat. They're going to draw all the defensive attention if we bootleg. You know, it's not going to be, you know, feet of stone quarterback that they're worried about primarily. They're going to probably let him run if it comes down to it. 
in preference to letting one of these three guys score with the ball on the bootleg pass. But because of the combination of those two threats, you know, the world's slowest 40-yard dash here, but more importantly, one, two, three receivers downfield in front of them, they're going to cover those deeper threats or else they give up the touchdown too easily or, or a very long gain. Okay? The combination of those two threats is what makes this play dangerous. The foot speed is what makes this play dangerous. And the fact that this guy is waiting in the middle with the best play in football is what makes this play dangerous. And hopefully I can get this thing to, to draw a little bit better than I have been. We're going to do what we call severe angle blocking. We're going to have the offensive line attack the line of scrimmage at a 30 degree angle. So it's not 45, it's not 90, it's not 45, it's like 30 degrees. And we're going to cover every gap along this whole front at an angle that gives us mechanical advantage. And you can prove this if any of you, hopefully not too many of you are studying physics, God help you. But if you study the part of physics called mechanics, you'll see that if you attack, you know, if this is, you can, you can do vector analysis, you can prove this about five different ways. If someone is attacking this way with 300 pounds of force, and someone is, is trying to counter him with 200 pounds of force, he's going to lose if he tries to just headbutt him. If he tries to just block him straight on, he's going to get his butt kicked. He's going to be going backwards ass over tea kettle most of the time. And that's why we don't try and, and block just like that. We do it sometimes, but we don't do it all the time so that they know that they can just load up and fire, you know, and, and get their monster here with 300 pounds of force to run over your guy with a big heart and only 200 pounds of force. That's why instead we're going to attack gaps. We don't care who turns up in the gaps. We're going to block gaps aggressively at a 30 degree angle because now if the guy here has 300 pounds of force, effectively you're going to negate that with a blocking angle that will give his 200 pounds of force, and, and you can do the maths on this. You can give him effectively 350 pounds of force in that direction, 400 pounds of force in that direction for a trap block. Trap blocks are always great because they give you the best mechanical advantage there is. If he's coming straight and you're going this way, he's going sideways, even if he's a gorilla. Okay? You don't block him this way. You block him this way, or even better yet, you block him this way. Okay? Because that's just physics. Plus, he doesn't see it coming. So psychologically, it's unexpected, too. He sees this guy disappear, and he thinks, you know, he's in the promised land. He's coming across, oops, sorry, and you knock him sideways. And then there's a gaping hole to run into. He, the guard, is going to wrap up here. The blocking back is not, in fact, running out here on the bootleg into the flat. But instead, he is going to come, and he's going to kick out the M lost defender over here, the guy that's responsible for containing the play. The guy who's probably pretty extremely sweep conscious after you run that speed sweep a few times. So he's looking out here more. He may even line up wider. Or when the ball snapped, he may actually aggressively come out here. Nice marker, dude. But you get the idea. He's going to respond to that incredibly fast athlete out here wide by basically trying to cut off the sweep. And that's why when he gets wider or when he starts moving outside hard and fast with a ball snap, we're going to run the power play. We're going to give the ball to this back, who's been doing the same fake up the middle, no matter if we're in the speed sweep or if we're running the bootleg. Excellent. I love technology. Thanks. All right. Ooh, colors. Outstanding. I'll stick with black. I'm boring that way. Okay. All right. You've got a nose band, you've got an end, you've got another tackle, you've got an end. One of the problems when you flip a tackle over is they don't really know where to line up. You can confuse defenses just by a little variation in the formation like that. It's harder in nine-man football. It's pretty much impossible in seven- and five-man football. But when you get up to 11-man ball, you can play around with things a little bit. You can flip a tackle over to the other side and then see where they're going to line up. Okay? Does the nose man stay on the center, even though the center is not the middle of the formation anymore? Usually. He gets used to lining up over the guy that's snapping the ball. 
that can create a bubble if the guy over here sticks with his rule and lines up on the outside tackle. Sometimes you can create a gap just by confusing their rules. And even if they follow, you know, sort of unbalanced line rules so that they're more or less evenly spaced, we don't care. Because again, we're attacking gaps at a 30 degree angle, so anyone we impact is going to know it. We're leading over here, we're kicking out over here. So what this looks like to the whole world, especially to a, a perceptive linebacker, he sees down, 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 down. He's sensing sort of a pull up into the defense, and he notices a kick out. This screams to him, power off tackle. This tells a good reading linebacker, you know, windows open, windows closed, boom, boom, boom. I'm going through my progressions, and I understand that because the, the hole is being opened here, there's a down block, there's a kick out, and there's a lead above it. This is where the ball's going. And so he's prepared to meet the ball carrier here. He's reading, he's reading, he's reading, and he's attacking. And he's downhill, and he is, by God, going to stop that guy for no gain. Problem for him, this is not a power off tackle play. It's a power play that's designed to hit wherever there's an opening. And we train the back to look for green grass, what Lombardi used to call daylight. Run to daylight was his philosophy. Option running, where you give the back the ball deep enough so that he can see what's in front of him. Okay, don't see grass, don't see grass, I see grass, boom. It may be straight ahead, it may be off tackle, it may be outside of end. He can't make a wrong decision. As long as we can look at the film and say, there was daylight, he saw it, he tripped, he didn't make any yardage, but he made the right decision. Conversely, looking at the film, he was running into three defenders. The hell was he thinking? All he has to do is find a place where there's no enemy helmet or shirt and run there, and he's right. So this play gives us myriad options for attacking the defense one of which is actually through the off-tackle hole, where that poor lonely linebacker is waiting. But since he's waiting there, then there's no daylight, which means we're not going to run there. If he does his job, he's just taking himself out of the play. He's probably their best run defender. And he's just eliminated himself from the play by design. Because of the way that we built this offense, we're forcing their best tackler out of the play. And now anyone with a mechanical advantage here who can budge their guy more than a foot or so, and that's going to be probably at least two out of these four linemen, maybe three or even all four, they're going to be creating all kinds of daylight on a regular basis because they're going to be hitting people with a mechanical advantage because part of the defense is out here worrying about the speed sweep threat. Part of the defense is out here worrying about the bootleg threat. So we're only talking five or six bodies maximum in the middle because of the way we've designed this, who are available to tackle this guy, who's our best inside runner. Okay, so the way that we've created this series, not play, you can stop a play, no matter how good it, it is, if, you, if that's all the other side runs. You can stop it. I don't care if they've got um, the, uh, the Jamaican sprinter. Right, I don't care if they've got Bolt here at wing back put him in motion, hand him the ball, and send him on the speed suit. I don't care. If that's all they do, we'll slow him down eventually. It may not be fun. It may not be pretty to look at. We may have three guys hanging on him. But if that's all they do, we're going to shut him down. If they do even one other thing, if they, if they fake a bootleg away from Usain Bolt, we're screwed. If we have to divide our attention, we're in deep trouble. The fastest man in history has the football. Oh dear. Okay? But if all they do is hand it to him, we're going to slow him down. We're going to have 11 men concentrating as one on the threat. That's why, on offense, we don't want the threat. We want threats every time the ball is snapped. We want to be able to threaten at least two or three different things in widely different parts of the field. And that may be a run and a deep pass. Okay, it may be two runs and a run pass option. Okay, as long as they can't cover this and this and this with the same defenders, we win. If we can be credible 
in the way we put these threats together, if we've got a guy with any foot speed, he's going to be the one who's either running the speed sweep or threatening it. If we've got a quarterback who can throw it all and doesn't work, walk like you know Frankenstein's monster when he's out here, we've got a good bootleg threat. And if we've got a guy who can pound the football inside, who's got heart, and he's got good leg drive, and he's got good forward lean, even if he's not you know, Lynch or you know, one of the great NFL runners, it doesn't matter. We're going to make yardage. Because we've eliminated most of the defense from the equation before he even starts. These are the odds that we like on offense. We want to give you guys every possible advantage, even if you're not a superstar. We want to make you more successful by the way we put things together on offense. Okay? So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six blockers. I haven't even counted the tight end here. My God, I'm slipping. <laughs> he is going to do what we call a hinge block, which is a pass block of a sort that you use when you're running a, a spread out pass. It's a way of checking against someone shooting this gap first. And then it's a way of guarding the backside of the play. And the way this works is if you're a tight end, the center's over here, the ball is snapped, whether you're in a two-point or a three-point stance, doesn't really matter. Your first step is back here to defend this inside gap. And we ask the tight end to split out a little bit more because he's generally quick enough to cover even a larger gap here. So he can spread himself out, makes himself more of a threat to release for a pass, and he can still get the job done in closing off this gap if someone's trying to shoot through it. So when the ball snap, boom, he's here. Is someone threatening the gap? Yes. Block him. Assignment done. We don't care about anything else at that point. The most important threat to the play is the one that shoots through inside. So we have him check that inside gap. Okay? No one's here. Pivot. Boom. Now, someone's coming around. Now, we're going to have him maintain position on that guy. And we're going to have him block him, 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 right out of the stadium. He's not going to get the easy route to the football. In block, check the inside gap, no one there, pivot, and make whoever's coming around this way go the long way. Don't give up. Block to the whistle. Always block to the whistle. But in particular, you know, this guy is going to get frustrated because he thinks he's going to come around here and blow up a play. Boom, 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 boom. We're going to block him until next week. Okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blockers, two fakers. Ah, the wide receiver. I knew I was missing someone. He's faking a block on the speed sweep. So he's still maintaining the attention of at least a cornerback, probably a safety as well. If he's anything of a threat, we can fake all of this, drop back and throw a play-action pass, and we do on a regular basis. And if they're not respecting him and his threat to go downfield, then they're going to be in a lot of trouble as well. So this is like three quarters, or really three fifths of the series. You can also run a great counterplay back this way by design, where you pull a couple of linemen. You know, if they get used to you running from here to here with the inside power play, and they get used to it, and they get used to it, then you can come back with a design counterplay where he gets the ball and then cuts back sharply this way. So there's a kickout block, there's a lead block, there's down blocking in this direction this time, and now there's a gazing hole. This is a design power play off tackle in the other direction. And if they run with the speed sweep motion, and if they're flowing this way, you're running up underneath defensive flow with this power play. But there's a time when they get like even further out here to try and s slow down the speed sweep that you actually literally cut back with special counter tray blocking over here, counter gap actually, and you, you have this pie wedge of open turf where there's no defenders at all, and you've got a big you know tackle or guard out in front of you, and, and you're off the races. Okay, and then on top of that, the fifth play in the series is the quarterback faking speed sweep faking the power play, and then he's booting this way because he's going to fake a block in here and then head for the, the flag, you know, for the outside corner of the end zone, and that's a touchdown most times, too. If you run this a couple of times a game, there's not going to be anywhere near him because they're, have to, they're having to deal with this threat and this threat, and they think they're having to deal with this threat until he reverses field and comes out this way with the football and a guy downfield 15 to 20 yards already. But the point is... This power play is the best play in football, to my mind, because it's the one that hits straight ahead with multiple possibilities. It's a run-to-daylight play. It's an honest-to-God option play where it's not just, you know, either here or here. It's not like 
I don't want to badmouth the zone run where you can either you know hit the crease or you can cut back. That's great football in its own way, except zone blocking is simple mentally, but it's hard physically. Because it doesn't give you, as an offensive lineman, a mechanical advantage. In fact, quite the opposite. It's asking you to sort of reach and, and bump someone. Maybe you've got help from a teammate, maybe you don't. You know, depending on how the defense reacts. Maybe it's a double team, okay, you can double team someone. Maybe you have them by yourself, and you don't know until the play develops. So zone blocking is everywhere. Everyone does it because, again, mentally it's easy. I tell you what, gap block's even easier. What are they doing? They're attacking a gap. They don't care who comes through it. Maybe no one comes through their gap, and if that, if that happens, then they keep going until they find someone that they can hit. So you've removed any kind of you know, mental block from your offensive lineman. You just attack a gap. And physically, you're giving them that mechanical advantage I was talking about. So gap blocking is actually a double win, whereas zone blocking is a mental win and a physical loss. You're not giving them a mechanical advantage when you zone block. And that's just my two cents worth. Because I know a lot of programs rely on zone blocking, and it's great in terms of being easy to teach mentally you know, what the assignment is, and it's hard to perfect physically. And if you're not a gorilla to begin with, you're probably not going to be a great zone blocker. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say it's a great scheme for people with small offensive linemen. That's not my experience. Gap blocking is a great scheme for people with smaller offensive linemen. Because again, not only are you eliminating thought, you don't care what the defense is doing. It's not like your rule is block this guy unless it's a Tuesday and then you block his grandmother. You know, blocking rules sound like that sometimes. I don't like rule blocking at all. I like gap systems. If necessary, I'll go to a zone system, but I prefer to also give the linemen a mechanical advantage. I want to make their life easier in every way. Mentally, we tell them, you know, that's your gap. Boom, step down into it every single time. We train people to gap block by lining them up with little boards. You know, normally you have a board that's just narrower than your normal stance, and you'll practice exploding out of your stance down the board. We turn the boards to a 30 degree angle from the line of scrimmage, and we do that. And we practice that. And we'll tell everyone, you know, one step, two step, we're going to walk them through the sequence. You know, the ball is snapped, boom, that's your first step. So everyone takes that same short first step down that 30 degree track. The board is still between their feet. You put their outside foot just outside where the board is. Boom, that's the first step. You know, and at the same time, they load their arms. So what do they do? The first, When we say one to our offensive lineman, when, do, when we're doing this drill with the boards at 30 degree angle, we say one, boom. And we say two, boom. And we tell them the person that gets the second step in first wins. It's the second step delivered with power, with an explosion, with a punch up and into the defender that wins the day. You're blocking at an angle. You're attacking as fast as you can. So, you know, in training we do one, two. But in real life it's one, two. You make the first step as fast as you can, and then the second step even faster. And you punch, you load your arms on the first step, and you punch on the second step, and then you keep going. And you keep punching, and you keep them off their balance. And a certain percentage of them are just going to go tumbling. And that's where your running back's going to find daylight. When you blow the guy right out of his tracks, all of a sudden he's got the ball back here. And he sees that you've eliminated this person because he's now, he's not in that gap anymore. He's like, you know, that. Okay? That's daylight. And you've just created that through your explosion, through following the steps that you've taken several hundred times in training. You know, boom, boom. You know what to do on the first step. You know what to do on the second step. And you follow those same steps every single time. We've eliminated the thought process for you. All you have to do is execute. And you know, you've trained it enough so that your muscle memory kicks in. Oh, what am I doing on this one? Gap. Boom. Boom. And off you go. You've knocked this guy into the next county. And this is an option now for your running back. It's not necessarily where he's going because there may be even a bigger gap over here because the defense has just done something wrong or they've been knocked down over there even more or the linebackers tripped or whatever. He has the option of 
your hole or the big hole or, you know, as long as there's no defender there when he's running, he can't be wrong. We like it when our guys can't be wrong. We like it when the defense can't be right. So this is the, this is sort of the theory of how you build deception into an offense. It's not the only way to do it. This is called misdirection. It's a particular kind of deception. There's another kind called ambiguity, and that involves giving the defense several different options and then choosing which one you exploit. And this more often has to do not just with like the wishbone triple option or these days the zone read, which is an option play, but also the passing game. Let's say you're in a pistol offense. There's a shortish snap to the quarterback. You can fake to the running back or he can just block at the edge. You can pass blocking gaps too. Because again, all you have to worry about is a gap. And it's the easiest thing in the world for these three offensive linemen to just step that way, you know, ball snapped, that's my gap. Someone shows. I'm blocking it. No one shows, I'm turning and helping my mate. Wherever the most important threat, the, the most immediate threat to the quarterback is, that's where I'm going to turn, and that's usually inside. So if he doesn't, you know, if he steps out and to block, pass block this gap and no one comes, he's checking inside. If there's no one there, he's checking even further inside. He's helping wherever he's needed. So mentally, this isn't tough. You know, ball snap, boom. Here's my gap. There's someone coming. I block him. There's no one coming. I look for the most important threat inside me because the direct route to the quarterback is the shortest one, the most dangerous. So he steps here. There's no one coming. He looks to see if the, quarter, if the center needs any help. No, he looks to see if the other guard needs any help. No? Okay. No problem. Quarterback's got all day to throw. We're probably going to win anyway. Now, it's hard with so few bodies out there to do real deception in any meaningful sense. But we got to try. We got to try. So one thing that we can do is run shallow crosses because they are an absolute bear to cover man for man. And they complicate zone pass coverage too. So the quarterback sees that there's man coverage. He sees there's tight man defenders on both of these receivers. You know, there's a cornerback here, a cornerback here. He knows that because this guy is passing underneath this guy, <clears throat> that what he's going to do by the simple action of crossing over here is he's going to physically eliminate tight man-for-man -man coverage boom, on this receiver. He's not running an illegal pick. This is not a pick. I don't teach picks. This is called a rub. These guys are crossing within a few inches of each other, within a space that's narrower than the defender's body, which is all that matters. You don't even have to particular. I mean, sometimes people coach rub shoulders. I don't do that. It's too easy to trip and knock both guys down, and then you look really stupid. And you've just taken both of the receivers out of the play without ever having a defender touch them. But let's say that there's sort of this much space in between the two receivers as they cross by each other. That's not enough for a defender to fit through. So he's going to run into him. He's going to rub that defender off him. And as of right here or thereabouts, he's wide open. And he knows this because he's seen man pass coverage. And as soon as he sees that, he knows he's looking for this guy coming this way as soon as the rub is complete. This, again, no rocket surgery involved. Okay, Man coverage. We don't care if a safety involves himself in this play or not because he's going to be moving too fast this way for someone here to cover effectively. So we know that if we wait a few steps out here, he's going to be open. And all we've done is spin a couple of pass routes together in a way that negates man pass coverage. So they're going to run zone. Okay, no problem. We can have a check that allows us to change the pass route if we see zone coverage. We can even, if we're really advanced, have the receivers themselves look to see what kind of pass coverage 
is being run and adjust the routes accordingly. <clears throat> For example, if we've got a situation where either by rotation or by design there's no sort of safety in the middle, and he comes out here, he's not looking at the cornerback behind him who may be man covering him, so he can't tell if he's being man covered. But he can sure as hell look over here and see if he's got man coverage. And if he does, then when he gets about here, he cuts downfield. He turns it into a street route. Guess who's getting the football? Mm -hmm. There's no deep safety in the middle. It's zone coverage. That's a gaping hole that we've exploited because we were looking to see if this guy was coming this way in man coverage. When he does this instead, he breaks his pass route up here. We can build this into an offense. It's not something that you've got to be able to know how to do on this split second basis. We make it so easy for this guy to decide, am I crossing or am I streaking? We show him one read. We say, he does this, you're streaking. He does this, you're crossing. End of discussion. As soon as he comes into a shallow cross, he's looking at this guy. Okay, and it's, it's simple. It's this or it's this. If he just sits there, you know, if he doesn't do anything at all, then that's essentially his own read. If he does anything other than tight man coverage, we're not going to bother with the rub. We're going to break this downfield. You know, if, if he just stands there picking his nose for whatever reason, that's not man coverage. And if it is man coverage and he's just forgotten, that means this guy's uncovered. So if he interprets this nose picking as zone coverage, he's going to cut down here. We don't care because this guy's wide open. There's no one covering. So we can't lose. Okay. Either we have a receiver here and a receiver here, or we have a receiver here and a receiver here. Either way, we make the defense wrong no matter what they do. And all we've done as a coaching staff is cross a couple of guys and given them, given him as the guy who's the underneath crosser, we've given him one rule. Read this guy. If he does anything other than tight man coverage on the other receiver, you're heading downfield. If he's on tight man coverage, then you're crossing and you're going to get the ball over here. That's all there is to it. Simple. Really, really difficult for the defense to guard against. Really, really, really hard. And this has taken like 100 years of football development to discover just how hard this play is to stop. And that's why the whole air raid offense is built around it. And if you haven't heard of the air raid, you will. Because it's what the most advanced passing programs in America at every level are using to base their passing principles from. And the idea is basically you spread people out, your best athletes, your, you know, your fastest people, you get them in open, open space in a way where the defense can't gang up on them. And if this sounds familiar, it's because it's the exact same principle as that speed sweep series I was showing you before. You prevent the defense from swarming and gang tackling and concentrating where our threats are because you don't tell them where our threats are. You don't want to do this on a regular basis. You don't want to be the guy that lines up and does this all the time. Okay, maybe there's times when you want to do this. Maybe you're down at the one inch line and either you're going to run a quarterback sneak or the quarterback's going to turn around and hand the ball off. Okay, in certain situations. All right? But you don't even want to do this every time in that same situation. Because if people are good at what they do as defensive coaches, they're going to understand what your situational tendencies are. Mm -hmm. And if you've run, you know, the same play 20 times from inside the two-yard line in goal line situations, they're going to be ready for it. And there are teams that do this. Every single time, they're going to run the same blinking play. And there's no need, because you know what? Just threaten the blue leg. Now there's two threats. Now they can't pile up seven guys here waiting. Now they have to respect this. He's a run and pass threat. So if he bootlegs, you know, Look here. Is he open? Throw him the ball. Touchdown. Is he covered? Yes. Is he open? Yes. Throw him the ball. Touchdown. Is he covered? Yes. If he's covered, he's covered. There's no one here to stop him running into the end zone. It's just that simple. And what did this take? What did it take for the offense to not just 
hand him the ball and then have him stand back here and, you know, you didn't make it, coach. What did it take to not do this, but to do this instead? How hard was that? Mm -hmm. That was a coach waking up one morning and saying, I've had a vision. I call it the bootleg. We'll prevent the defense from ganging up on our man. Angels will sing. I mean, you know, how hard is this to figure out? Now there's two threats. You can design more threats than that in if you want to. You don't need to. But for heaven's sake, as a coaching staff, give your players every advantage. It's the one inch line, all right? You've got a good running back, you've got a good offensive line. Bootleg fake anyway. Make them worry about this. Take one or two defenders out of the equation. Now it's six on five. Guess who's going to win that? Nine times out of ten. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, who's going to win that on the goal line? You with a good running back and the big offensive lineman, and you're playing against only five defenders because there's two out here worried about the, the quarterback threat. Guess who's going to win that? You are. Guess who's going to lose that sooner or later if all you do is pound the ball in there? You are. Because sooner or later, there's going to be seven guys waiting for that ball carrier. They're going to ignore everything else because they know they can because they've studied your tendencies. So your job is to show up for training with as much enthusiasm as you can manage, even on a Sunday morning, <laughs> listen to your coaches, concentrate, work hard, get yourself strong, get yourself fit, get yourself fast, okay? And the coaches' staff's job is to put you in the best position to succeed. That's their responsibility, to keep you safe, to help you be the best football player you can be, to help you improve as a human being generally. How do you do that? By making you part of a team, by making you concerned for other people than just yourself, by making you care what happens to, you know, the other guy, even the one over on the sideline who's not playing too many repetitions because he's just not that good a player. You care about him anyway, even if you're the star of the team, because he's part of your band of brothers. All right? And as a coaching staff, it's our responsibility to make every single one of you feel like that. You're out here for something bigger than just yourself. Whether you're a superstar, whether you're a pleb, okay? Whether you're the worst player in the league, you're going to give it everything you've got. In practice, you're going to try as hard as you can because that's going to make the superstar better. It's going to make everyone on your team better if you give what you've got. It's an important part of the game whether you're going to be in the headlines next week or not. Okay? And if you don't feel that way, you should not be out here. If you think this is about you winning the Heisman Trophy someday, you shouldn't be here. If that's all you're concerned about, if it's just you and the glory, you don't belong here, however good you are. Even if you're a real candidate for the Heisman Trophy, ultimately you will be a cancer who will destroy a team by only being concerned about himself. If you're not willing to give of yourself for your band of brothers, especially when times are tight, especially when things are going against you, when it's muddy, when it's cold, when you're losing by three touchdowns, when you don't want to be there. If you're not giving everything you've got, you don't belong there. And I don't care if you are a superstar. You know, if you're not willing to give of yourself in that situation, you shouldn't be here. And that's a thought to leave you guys with. All right? Thanks for your attention.